Well, it has been an exciting evening uh, already tonight, especially for those of you who are here at four o'clock for our our town meeting, town hall meeting. The communication we've received, it, it's encouraging, it's exciting. There's the, just the future on the horizon. We know that many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord directs his steps. And it's wonderful to see that God has also instilled for us an eldership, a leadership that is seeking to show those plans. And I, my prayer is that they will come to fruition above and beyond our, our every plan. And as we, we look this evening, 1 Peter chapter 5, I'm reminded of what we just experienced at the town hall meeting in the entire chapter. But I, I love the, the, the chapter 5, verse 5. The second part of it says, Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. You know, 21 years ago, I, uh, I remember it was Lads to Leaders that year. I was 13 years old. And, uh, I, and I, was, I decided that I was going to do Centurion of Scripture that year. And so I decided to memorize 1 Peter chapter 5. And so I didn't realize that 21 years ago I was preparing for this lesson tonight. But I, I remember the reason behind it was because I love 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 8. Be sober and vigilant because your enemy the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And I remember my 13-year-old self just, you know, that's the, it was the neatest passage. And that was my reason behind wanting to memorize that verse. But I said, well, I'm going to memorize the, the, the chapter. And I counted the verses and I counted the chapter uh, from other things and was able to get the hundred verses together. And, and, and in fact, so I also decided that same year, my first lesson I was going to ever write for Lads to Leaders... I said, well, I'm not going to reinvent something. I'm going to do my first lesson from 1 Peter chapter 5. So my first lesson ever was on the qualifications of elders. And I am convinced that the elders where we were thought that the preacher put the preacher's son up to it. I, I, I'm not sure. But you just got the context to that. But what does clothing ourselves with humility, what does a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, and the qualifications of elders have to do with anything? Well, based on this passage, we're going to find out that it means everything for the congregation. It means everything for making sure that we're clothed with humility toward one another, including our eldership and our flock, because the lion is on the prowl. But that is just a, a very quick way to, to sum it up. I'd like for us to look at verses 1 through 4, and recognize that the elders are clothed with humility, where Peter is mentioning here. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, beginning, he says, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. So he's exhorting elders and immediately mentions that he was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. It was alluded to that sometimes the role of an eldership, uh, the role of an elder is very challenging. That there is suffering that goes along with this. I think it's very important that we recognize that and that we esteem our elders because they are laying their life on the line for this congregation. They're also dedicating their life to the Lord in service to this congregation. But recognizing first and foremost that it was Christ who suffered first. So that we all could follow in his pattern. That's why he then says, verse 2, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. As God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. I believe what we just experienced for the last 45 minutes, the last hour, was this to a T. Recognizing that, that this is not under compulsion, it's willingly, and it's not for shameful game, it's not domineering over, because let me tell you, there, if it was domineering over, we would never have had any privy to this information. 
It would have been behind closed doors. So the blessing is that we have this communication from our eldership. Therefore, they have been willing to clothe themselves with humility among the flock. And the, the reason is, we have the answer of who shepherds a shepherd. In verse 4. When the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. What Peter is saying is, yes, Christ suffered, and he was a witness of that, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Going to be revealed when Jesus returns. Jesus, who is the chief shepherd. So who shepherds a shepherd? It is Jesus the Christ. So he is to be the head of every, uh, in essence, the chair of every meeting. He is to be the head elder. He is the only one who could be called pastor in the singular. Because notice it says, shepherd the flock of God with th that is among you. When he says, to the, to, to the fellow elders, I exhort. Elders, plural. Pastors, plural. The only one who can have a singular name is Jesus Christ. And so that causes us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And that begins with our eldership. Who is the shepherd? Jesus is the shepherd. And in fact, he alludes to this in John chapter 10. If you'll turn there with me. John chapter 10. Verse 11, beginning. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. This evening... I submit to you that our shepherds care deeply for their sheep. Amen? I need to hear amen again. Amen? amen? They care deeply for the sheep and the way they have, they have put their life on the line. Verse 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So as we see, as elders are clothed with humility, and then in response to this, members are clothed with humility. Our key passage that I read before we began, verse 5, says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with Humility toward one another. So notice it says, who's, who's just been mentioned? The elders and then those who are younger. This would be the elders and the members. The flock, the shepherds and the flock. So notice it says, clothe yourselves all of you. So this is the shepherds and the flock to be humble with each other. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. So, this is how, obviously we've seen that it's not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock, that takes on humility. That shows how a flock can humble themselves to one another when they follow the example of the elders. So notice, this is a, a humility with all of us, together. And there's a reason why. Why, you might ask, he says, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I don't want to stand in the presence of God opposed. I don't want God to oppose me. I don't want God to oppose you. So notice it is literally pride that causes us to be opposed. That's why... In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, we're told, He who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. We'll see that here in just a moment. He who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. The concept is pride. We hear that pride comes before a fall. It's based on that passage. Notice verse 7 says, or verse 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you. 
So notice, God wants you to be exalted, but it's in His time, not yours. He doesn't want you to be, to, to be so proud that you think you're above God. It's the concept of if you're willing to humble yourself, He will lift you up. If you're not willing to humble yourself, notice, He will oppose you. And that will be a humbling experience, will it not? And I believe that's what Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 and 13. If you will, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. Notice, for there is no temptation that has overtaken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you'll be able to endure it. Notice it says, he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. There's no temptation. Recognizing that we are all going to be tempted. Temptation is going to come the moment we think we stand. Well, you know what? I'm, I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good about where I am in life. I feel pretty good about, about, uh, about my, my faith. I, you know, you may say something like that. I feel good about finances. I feel good about, you know, where I am in my faith or my family. Watch out. <laughs> you know, I, I feel like I've arrived. Watch out. What that passage is saying, you're going to be tempted. But notice, no temptations overtaking you except what is common to man. So, no, there is no one who's not going to be touched by the tempter's power. We are all in the same boat when it comes to that. So is that not a humbling thought? Yes, it is. But God is faithful. Recognizing God has faith in you. But you've got to have faith in God. You can't have faith in yourself. He thinks he stands, take he lest he fall. God has faith in you. He'll not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation will provide that way of escape. Well, I don't know anyone who can't just walk through an exit sign. I mean, look around. You see the exit signs. In, in, our, in our town hall meeting, we talked about exit signs. We talked about exit strategies and things like that. It's very simple to walk through an exit. <clears throat> but the last part of that verse explains why. It's going to be more of a challenge. We'll see a way of escape that we may endure. See, because if I imagine that this is a way of escape, to say, well, I escaped the temptation, I'm standing again. Satan's not touching me again because I've escaped. Well, there's a circle, isn't it? He who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. I'm going to have to escape again and again and again and be willing to recognize that way of escape and be willing to recognize that God is faithful and he will not let me be tempted beyond my ability. So it causes me to recognize I need to be humble in the presence of God as we saw back in 1 Peter chapter 5. Notice when I'm facing temptation, the best way to respond to that temptation is in a humble way. But also in verse 7, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. When I think about casting something, I, I think about, well, I think about a spin caster. <laughs> uh, I think about a fishing rod, Zebco 33. <laughs> That's what I think about with casting, throwing it as far as I can. But I think we need to recognize that there is someone else that is casting a lure. Let no one say when he's being tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt anyone. But each one is lured and enticed by his own desire. And desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin. And sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. What does that tell us? Who is setting the lure on that hook? It's Satan. That's why he says, verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. That's James 1, verse 13 through 16. May, may we recognize that Satan is on the prowl. 
And that gets us to our third point. We've got to recognize that elders are to clothe themselves in humility. Members are to be clothed with humility. Why? Because Satan is clothed with humility. But let's stop and think about how is he clothed with humility. You know, we just read, or, or just quoted earlier, 1 Peter 5, verse 8. He's a roaring lion. And we think about a roaring lion. Well, you know, I, I think about a roaring lion that, you know, I think I'm going to tell whether there's a roaring lion approaching. But he disguises himself. If you will, look at 2 Corinthians we're going to look at ver, ver, chapter 11. Verse 13. It says, For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. So this is Paul. He's warning the Corinthians that there are going to be false apostles. Apostello means one sent. Those who say that they're sent by God, but they are false. They're liars. And I love verse 14. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He's a lion that he's waiting to devour someone, but I don't believe he presents himself as a lion. In fact, I, I believe he presents sin like a tiny little mouse. I think about it like a little mouse. Maybe you've seen a mouse in a cage or at a pet store, and it's kind of cute. They have a little cute look to them. But maybe you were at Camp Maywood for an entire week, and a mouse decided to make its home in your air conditioner unit inside your van. It happened. On Wednesday, Mary calls me, and I was with... John Gallagher, we were over at the hospital, and I'm driving back in my truck, and, and, uh, and, and Mary calls, she says, the van stinks horribly, and she says, we can't turn the air conditioner on, it's, it's horrible, and so I go, and I get home immediately, I turn it on, it was the smell of death. <laughs> That's how we found it. I spent most of the morning yesterday pulling out that nasty, horrible vermin from inside that duct. What, what are you talking about, Richard? Sin is like a mouse. There is no temptation that's overtaking you except what is common to man. But God is faithful. <clears throat> and he'll not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you'll be able to endure it. But sometimes we recognize sin as something that is just minuscule. It's small and I won't have to endure because it's just little. Everyone does it. Everyone struggles. But let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt anyone. But each one is lured and enticed by his own desire. And desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. I mentioned sin is like that mouse. Notice temptation wasn't the sin. It's giving into it that gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. When that mama gave birth to those babies. Inside that van, it brought forth death in the Alabama heat. And the smell, the rancid nature of sin. May we recognize that that is what we're dealing with here. And it will permeate every part of your life. And it will destroy, and it will be dis disgusting. But we've got to realize that it's Satan himself who disguises himself as an angel of light, as this cuteness. Jesus himself warned in Matthew 7 and verse 15 through 16. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. We're talking about elders, shepherds with the flock, right? So elders are to clothe themselves with humility. The flock is to clothe itself with humility. Satan is also going to clothe himself with humility and look just like you. He's going to look like a sheep. But inwardly, he's a ravenous wolf. Beast. That's why he says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober and be watchful or vigilant. Because your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, 
seeking someone to devour. If I see a lion in the street that he's about to come at me, you better believe I'm paying attention. I'm not going to say, hold up, hold up. I got to check my email right quick. I, I'm not going to say, you all, I'm distracted by so many other things. I don't have time to be gobbled up right now, Satan. No, the point is be sober and vigilant because we're not going to see him approaching until he's gobbled us whole if we're not. So we're be sober and vigilant because your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So as I'm facing temptation, if I have, if, if, if I have a proud nature, I'm going to fall. And this applies, notice this is applying to elders and to the flock. But I've got to be willing to cast all my anxieties on Him. I can't allow those to stand. I can't allow those to be a, become just, well, that's just who I am. I have to throw those on the Lord. And I know that I go to this passage a lot, but Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, beginning does help to set the stage here. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God will guard you. He will give you a peace that... that it goes beyond your understanding. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. If we're willing to put trust in God then, and cast all our anxieties on Him, then we're not going to grab hold of anything Satan casts our way. We're not going to take hold of that lure that's enticing. We're going to give our lives to the Lord. And that's the concept of being clothed in Christ. If you will, look at Galatians chapter 3. <laughs> Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come. We are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. How are you a son? How are you a child of God through faith? For as many of you as were immersed into Christ have put on Christ. My question for you this evening is if you've been clothed with Christ... What Satan wants more than anything is for you to not be clothed in Christ. He wants you to be destroyed. He wants to gobble you whole. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9 says, Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. This is very similar to what Paul said, that there is no temptation that's overtaking you except what's common to man. This is why we have the flock. This is why we have our shepherds to protect us, to take care of us. But so often we, we recognize this, this time of an invitation. And, and, and I believe that we, we say, oh, I can't let any issues be known. It was mentioned about CASA, Christians Against Substance Abuse. And I believe that we have this persona that we just can't, we can't be seen that, we've, that we struggle. We can't be seen that we have anything out of order. 
And if that is the case, if we cannot come bearing our burdens to each other, and the fact we have to, st- we have to classify or clarify that what happens in Casa, what is said in Casa stays in Casa, what is said here should stay here, except for spoken to God. We shouldn't have to clarify those things. Because we have a flock where we are taken care of, we are protected by an, the oversight of these shepherds, where we can also encourage each other. Can you imagine if the mentality was the way it is today with the invitation? What if it, the mentality that we have now was in Acts chapter 2 and verse 40? When Peter said with many other words, he entreated them, save yourselves from this crooked generation. But, you know, their response was, you know, my heart is hitting me and it's telling me what I need to do and what I need to make, make, make a change. But what are people going to think about me? How many of the 3,000 would have remained? How many of the 3,000 wouldn't have stepped forward and been clothed with Christ? Coming, confessing that He is Lord. Recognizing that, yes, we killed the Messiah. But He is Lord and repenting of their sins and being immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. The one they just recognized that they had killed. You recognize the grace that they experienced. The freedom in Christ that they experienced but could have been gone if they weren't willing to put themselves out there. With many other words, He entreated them. He pleaded with them. Save yourselves. We just saw that we have an eldership that loves this flock. That is shepherding this flock. They ask for your prayers. Yes, they have every Monday. And I want to ask you, if you will, pray for them. Pray for for the difficulty that they are facing. I already mentioned this morning about how challenging it was for three years working with a congregation without an eldership. When we don't have 1 Peter chapter 5, Satan smiles just a little bit more. May we recognize that we have this protection and we have this flock that is striving to grow. But maybe there's something like that little tiny mouse that you're allowing to get into your life. Before you know it, that little mouse is going to wreak havoc and you're not going to smell it until death has taken place. Will you get rid of that little, that little thing, that vice that you're holding on to? Because Satan's going to use it. We have an invitation, and with many other words, I could stand up here. But I'm asking you, do you have a need tonight? Don't go another moment without letting it be known. Whatever that, whatever that need is, come. While together we stand and while we sing.